a final checkup before the launch. This unusual contraption is on its way to the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. Once submerged two and a half thousand metres below the surface, it's going to be connected to a sprawling network of scientific instruments deployed over the last few years. It's quite an operation, and it's one of the first steps in installing our new detector at the bottom of the sea. So, we're pretty excited. We are a bit nervous as well, because all operations like these are risky. You need to coordinate several elements at the same time, several boats, underwater robots. But we're confident things will work out. We're working with professionals here. The crew of the ship and the team working the robot, things should be just fine. The team is deploying what's known as a detection line, a key component of KM3Net, a particularly ambitious scientific instrument. Once fully installed at the bottom of the sea, 40 kilometres from the city of Toulon, the detector will enable scientists to study some of nature's most mysterious particles, neutrinos. Neutrinos have uh, no charge, their mass is very close to zero and they only interact through, through the weak interaction. To some extent, they're the closest to nothing that you can get. That makes them incredibly difficult uh, to detect. Uh, and this is the reason we have to build these uh, absolutely enormous detectors just to have a chance to detect uh, a handful of neutrinos as they pass. So millions of neutrinos will pass through the detector and just, uh, just a few of them will actually interact. And those precious neutrinos are what we, uh, we spend uh, many years of our life trying to uh, detect and, and understand. Neutrinos are created by nuclear reactions like those going on in the centre of our sun. Other sources include violent cosmic phenomena, like the explosion caused by the death of a star. These particles interact so little with the matter around us that billions of neutrinos fly through the Earth and our bodies each and every second with no effect. To increase the odds of observing the interaction between a neutrino and matter, one needs as much of it as possible. And there's no bigger source of matter available to us than that beneath our feet. Once a neutrino interacts with Earth, it produces a secondary particle called a muon. As it travels through the seawater, this muon will produce a cone of bluish light that can then be detected by the many light sensors or optical modules of the instrument. These strings of optical modules need to be placed at precise locations on the seabed. Flash back to three years ago at the CPPM, the Particle Physics Centre of Marseille. This is where the strings of optical modules are assembled into what looks like a ball of yarn. This operation can take weeks. Each optical module is made up of 31 photomultipliers. Light sensors so sensitive that they can detect a single photon. This peculiar configuration enables the team to carefully place the line onto the seabed before letting it unravel all at once. The spherical cage can then be salvaged and reused for one of the many successive lines to be deployed on this site. One of the things we really need to do before sending the line into the water is to check the cables crisscrossing around the optical module. You need to carefully check each configuration, that the cable is correctly placed, that it's not snagged anywhere, that there's no strange loop like the one you see here. This is something we need to fix because it can be a source of problems. These are the last minute verifications we have to carry out. Once placed on the seabed, the line is then connected to the junction box already installed. 
You can see it here during its final adjustments at the CPPM in 2014. It's the heart of the instrument that centralises all of the data being produced by the various sensors. It also distributes the power needed to run the whole detector. Reliability is the most important thing here. It's got to sit 10 to 15 years at the bottom of the sea without needing any intervention. So 2,500 meters below the surface, that's a pressure of 250 bars, 250 kilos per square centimeter. Yeah, that's a quite a bit of pressure. It's an ROV, a small robotic submarine that controls the position of the line on the seafloor. The same robot will release the ball to let it unravel vertically. So once the line is at the bottom, the robot will grab the connector and plug it into the junction box. Then we'll contact those at the shore so they can power it up. And now, at long last, the first detection line is ready to be deployed. The cage can start its long descent to the depths of the sea. Patrick, bon, euh, pour Sylvain, c'est bon, le contrôle de l'intégrité de la DU. On attaque le déverrouillage du câble, puis le déroulement. Ok, c'est bon, allez-y. C'est parti. Carefully piloted from the control room, the robot connects the detection line to the junction box.
This permanent underwater infrastructure is also useful for marine biologists and environmental scientists. They joined the team and hooked up their own sensors to the instrument. This way they can power their sensors and send their data back to shore in real time. What makes this instrument innovative is the fact that the many sensors can communicate their data to us in real time. Previously, when we dropped one of these lines with temperature, pressure and oxygen sensors, we got the data after the operation was done, which could be a year later after having retrieved the whole thing. There was quite a risk of losing all of our data. In the town of Le Seine-sur-Mer, all of the data arrives from the different underwater instruments. With the first line installed and ready, it's time to check that all is functioning as planned. So now we're in the control room of uh, Cane 3 Net France, and uh, we're looking at the first data that's coming from, from the string that we deployed uh, yesterday. And uh, here you can see uh, three example events from, from the detector. And uh, each flash kind of indicates the direction from where the light is coming. And the color indicates the timing. So this is really exciting. Uh, for the first time, uh, we see that the string is working, giving data. All the optical modules are working, so really, really happy. The successful deployment of the first detection line paves the way for future operations. The idea is to install about a hundred of these lines on the site. There is still much to be done before the scientists can fully operate the instrument and start studying these mysterious neutrinos. <laughs>